Good morning. And welcome to Oak Hill Baptist Church. Good to see everyone here this morning. Just glad you chose this place to come and worship. And, that, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're, we're, we're gonna, we have some fun doing that. We should. Uh, he saved us, so let's be happy and worship. But first, I've got a few announcements here. Um, our children are going to be going to Aldersgate. We've been talking about this for a few weeks. They are going on February the 4th at 1045, and you can sign them up on the bulletin board, your child, if you want them to go. This is a great ministry. They're going to bring some joy to some people that need it. My mother's out there, so I go out there a lot. It's a wonderful ministry for the kids to go out there and spread this joy. They need some things from us. There's a donation box back there. They need hard candy, lotion, and no-slip socks, and they're going to pass that out to the residents on February 4th. And if you need any more information on that, see D.D. Mayfield. Also on the bulletin board, Wednesday night supper, sign-up sheet. Sign up, help them out. They need a close count on how many people are coming. If you forget, you can call the church before Tuesday at lunchtime and tell them, put your name down, and they'll, they'll have a good count. Choir practice today at 5. Bible study, all our groups, our youth, men and women, are at 6 o'clock here at the church. And in your bulletin, there are a lot more announcements and activities. You should have received one when you came in. Look at it and find a place that, that you can be used in God's church. So let's worship. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Please stand with us. Amen. Let's continue singing, He Lives.
Jesus.
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. The good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear oh let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all for your good let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty, who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus, oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave, ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus, his love is strong and his grace is the good news is I know that he can do for you what he sent for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for that, Peyton. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer as we get started this morning. Father God, we come to you today, and we are thankful, grateful, and humble. Just being able to gather in your house of worship, being able to come together and, and uh, just simply open up our hearts and yield ourselves to you. And I pray today that you will use us in a very dynamic way out in this world and that you will use your word as well as the music uh, that we have sang today uh, to simply spark a fire in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to get you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans uh, chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. The title is, Can We Continue in Sin? And sin is one of those subjects that we really don't like to talk about. But it's a subject that we need to talk about, and I know, uh, I understand the seven deadly sins. This is not what this message is about. It's not about pointing out the seven deadly sins and, and all of that. It is about the, the struggles we have with sin and how we can overcome these struggles that we face every day. 
And Paul, in his writing to Romans, he had dealt with this issue because there was a, a problem of uh, the, the law versus grace. And so there was a problem there. And, and I want to say this because I want to be very, very clear, uh, and I want to set the tone for the whole message. You cannot work your way into heaven. I want you to be clear about that. But salvation, it comes from grace alone, not by the law. But when salvation comes, work should be produced as the fruit that takes place in our hearts as a result of that salvation. So we're saved for works, not by works. We're saved so that we will live and do the works of God and we will live according to his standards. But we can't work our way into heaven. And uh, that's a struggle and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So he deals with this and he's answering a question and as he, as he compares law uh, to grace and so he's, he's focusing on this and it says this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection." Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over us. When we look at this, this is it's quite a passage, and it's a lot of information in there, and I'm going to share some things that I, I think are important. I want to get this item out of the way as well before we start. I'm, I'm speaking to a Christian community, and I want you to realize that. I'm speaking to those that are saved when we're talking about sin and uh, what we need to do. I will reference some unsaved in a moment, but we, we need, there's a few things that we need to know. Once you die, you don't get a second chance. I want to clarify that right now. Once you die, there's no purgatory. There's nowhere you're going to go in a holding place. You're not going to have a second chance at salvation. So the salvation, if you want and desire to be saved, you have to do it on this side of death, on this side of eternity. There's no second chance later. You can't do it later. And people will say things like, well, I've got the rest of my life. Well, exactly how long is that? And I, I'll let you tell me that. I'll let you answer that. Exactly how long is that? Well, the truth is we don't know exactly how long that is. It could be five minutes. It could be uh, 20 years. It could be 100 years. I don't know. But what I do know is the uncertainty of death is only in its time frame, but the certainty of it is the inevitability of it is coming, and we have to make a decision on this side of death where we're going to spend eternity. There are no second chances. And so I want you to know that. I want to clarify that. I don't want any misunderstanding about that. But now there are some things that we talk about when we think about grace and we think about sin, you know, a lot of times it's been misunderstood and misrepresented to think that and, and, and misused what Paul has said, we're saved by grace alone and uh, not by works, but grace is also coupled with repentance. And so I, I, I want to share this with you today. Sin has caused problems for people since the Garden of Eden. It, sin is destructive. It ruins lives, marriages, families, jobs, relationships, oneself, and it separates Christians from the fellowship with God. Now, I want, let, me refer, let me say that again. I want to uh, reiterate that. It separates Christians from fellowship with God. You know, when Paul sinned with Bathsheba, I mean, excuse me, uh, David sinned with Bathsheba, 
and uh, Nathan the prophet confronted him, what David prayed was that God would restore the joy of his salvation. In other words, David said, I want the fellowship back with you. It wasn't that he lost his uh, salvation with God. He wanted the fellowship back with God because sin separates us from that fellowship. The reason God does not like sin is because he knows how destructive it is. He knows the pain that it causes and the suffering that it brings into the lives of many people, not just one person. And, and people say, well, it's, it's just me. It's what I'm doing. It's what I want to do. Yes, but it's never limited to affecting only you. It affects other people around you. Sin is a rot that spreads from one to another, and if we're not careful, that rot will take over our lives. Sin is most often interpreted as an immoral act, which that is, but it's not the only thing. If you read a secular definition, it only includes things that are reprehensible or serious. Now, let me ask you this. What do we consider reprehensible and serious? Well, that depends on the person you ask. And, and so the one that we need to consult with is God and determine what he thinks is reprehensible and repulsive and destructive. By the way, sin is not limited to immoral acts. It is anything that violates God's moral standards. It is anything that is contrary to what God says is good, the way God says that we ought to live. It is anything that violates God's standards, period. And his grace for you and it's for me so that we can rest in assurance with him knowing that he has forgiven us for the sins in our life. He has removed that from us when we have truly asked for forgiveness and repented of them. We sometimes rank sin by excusing it as no big deal. It's really, what's, what's really wrong with it? And we start asking questions and then what happens is we seek counsel from people who are going to uh, condone what we're doing or give us the, the uh, um, I guess, the pat on the back that we're looking for or agree with us over what it is we're doing. And, and we want people that's always going to be in line with us. And other times we lump sin together and saying that, well, all sin is equal. Well, all sin equally violates God moral stand, God's moral standards, that is. But all sin is not equal. And you might say, well, I disagree with that. Well, that's fine. You know, we can disagree. But I'll give you one example of a sin that carries a greater consequence than any other sin. And the Bible states it clearly in Luke 21.10, Mark 3.29, and Matthew 12.31. And we call it the unpardonable sin. And so that sin has different consequences than other sins. It means that we can't be forgiven for this particular sin. So we might ask, what is this particular sin? What is the unforgivable sin? When we use the word unpardonable and then couple it with sin, that's a big clue that there's trouble associated with this sin. That's a huge clue. And so it is unforgivable. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And, and we can look at it in different ways, and it's really a strong word when we look at it in that regard, Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the ongoing rejection of God, His Spirit, working in you, trying to lead you to salvation in Christ by believing and repenting, believing in Him and repenting of your sins. It can also be defined, uh, be defined as defying the Holy Spirit, and we look at it in that way as well. But it's a little more involved than just that. It is associating God with evil. It is saying that God is evil, and, and uh, matter of fact, um, it really degrades his righteousness. And in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, the Pharisees did exactly this when Jesus had cast out a demon, and they accused Jesus of having a demon, Beelzebub. They said, you cast him out by the spirit of a devil. And Jesus questioned them and said, what devil would cast his own spirit out? And so... He would later say this about the Pharisees, that if you really wanted to lean on your works to get to salvation, you would have to be more righteous than they are. They keep certain standards. They live by standards. But they don't live by faith in God. And, and so he points this out by saying, if you had known the Father, you would know me. 
And they accused him of being a devil. These were people who lived righteously. They tried to avoid certain things. We know that they got involved in many things, and they did a lot of things, but they lived by certain standards. They accused him of being demon-possessed. God will not forgive you if you reject him all the way to death. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? If you die lost, you're going to stay lost for all eternity. And, and when we use the term lost, I don't mean like wandering around in the city trying to find your car. I mean you're eternally separated from God, living in the punishment and the torment of an eternal hell that was created for the devil and his demons, and that's where you will spend eternity, and that is a horrible thing, and we should never, ever spend eternity there. If we reject the salvation that God offers through Christ as revealed by his Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. There will be no more. And you think, well, how long will God give me a second chance? Well, as long as you're breathing, you've got a chance. But I do believe that there is a point where God will withdraw his spirit from you. That he won't bother you anymore because you see when we go back and we talk about the sins we often put everything together and say well they're all equal well no they're not God talks about sexual sin more than he does any other sin the Bible does and the consequences of it because sin affects the lives of people there's sins of lying there's sin of gossip there's sin uh, of being slothful there's uh, gluttony we don't want to talk about that one much but we talk about gluttony and, and uh, by the way, that's using a fork too much. Let me just make it simple and plain. That's what it is. As a preacher, if you committed gluttony, well, I'll let your eyes decide. So we, we find ourselves in these categories sometimes, and we, we want to downplay it. But what we, what we really need to do is repent. We need to repent, and repent, repentance, as I've shared with you numerous times, but I can't ever share this enough, it's not just doing an about-face and going the other direction. It is doing an about-face in an upward direction. It means I'm turning away from this, but I'm looking up to Jesus as the author and finisher of my faith to lead my life away from this. But when it comes to sin, we all struggle with sin. Your sin may be a different one than mine, but we all have struggles with sin. There are sins that, that we struggle with on a daily basis. Some may not be a daily basis, but we struggle with them because we're sinners and we live in a sinful world. And so we struggle with sin. And you say, well, how do I avoid sin? Well, we, in order to repent of it, it means that we have to turn from it. We have to separate ourselves from that sin. But it goes a little bit further. We have to separate ourselves from anything that would lead us back to that sin. We don't want to just simply say, I'm not going to do that anymore, and then continue down the same path because you're destined to fall. We have to separate ourselves from it. We have to make sure that we have positioned ourselves strategically in such a way that that sin cannot creep in our door and lure us away from what we need to do and what we should be doing. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, it's very clear that we should not continue in sin when we are saved. And, and this is where Paul is going with this. There should be a change in your life. There should be evidence of the salvation that you have. There should be something different about you. You see, we're not only saved to go to heaven, we're saved from the sin that we face. And Paul said, should we continue in this sin that even more grace may abound? God forbid, no. No. The world will tell you sin is okay. They'll tell you that nothing's wrong with it. And they'll do everything they can to bring you down and to get you involved in it because when people who are living in it get you involved in sin, then that means they don't feel quite so bad and they can do a little finger pointing. We don't want to do that. We want to be different. Now, in saying that, don't tow the Bible around beating people over the head, okay? You be a living example 
it's one thing to preach what we ought to do, but it's another thing to live the way we're supposed to live. And so we have to couple both of those together. But I'll tell you this, please don't preach it if you're not going to live it. Don't take your Bible club around beating people over the head and then doing whatever you want to do because somehow or another it doesn't apply to you. And I'm going to tell you it applies to me just like it does everyone else. And I better be living the right way because there's no one that can tell you how a Christian should live any better than a non-Christian. A non-Christian, they're quick to tell you exactly how you should live and exactly what you're doing wrong and exactly what God's Word says, even though they don't know anything about it. They're quick to tell you and they're quick to condemn you because they've got these preconceived notions of what it means to be a Christian. They've got these ideas that you're going to go around beating people and, and you're a, a Mr. or Mrs. Goody Two Shoes, as the old saying would go, or that you beat people over the head with the Bible. That's not what being a Christian is about. It is about a person who has repented of their sin, accepted the salvation of God, and they're living in God's grace without mocking Him. That's what it means. The habit of sin has enormous control in our lives. And, and I know the Bible mentions, we've categorized them through the years as seven deadly sins, but it mentions seven sins that have that type of consequence. And you say, well, uh, James also said that um, it, when we sin, some sin brings, it, it brings forth death. You say, well, I've sinned it didn't die. Well, let me tell you, there's a part of you every time you sin that does die. There's a little part of you that changes. There's a part of you that, that does fall victim to that sin. God's grace has freed us from the penalty of sin, and we need to live in that freedom. But I want you to notice this. His grace only forgives us of the sins that we repent of. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 26, I talked about this last week in our men's Bible study. It says that once you have received the knowledge of truth and you continue in sin, there remains no more forgiveness for you. That means if you choose to sin and reject God, you say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, this is not how it works. That's not a license to continue sinning. That's not a license to continue doing whatever you feel like doing. And people will say, yeah, but I asked God to forgive me right before I did it. What? Really? Wait a minute. God forgive me. I'm about to sin. That's not how it works. You see, you don't ask for forgiveness for what you're about to do. You ask for forgiveness for what you've done, and you change from that. You turn from that. You take a different path. I'm not going to do this anymore. One thing we fail to look at is the stronghold that sin has in the lives of people. When I say this, I'm not referring to someone who has an addiction, and they've been struggling for years, and they've been fighting against it, trying to overcome it, and maybe they've gone for a year uh, on a drug addiction, and they slip back into this, and then they're battling it. This is not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to someone who has made up their mind they're going to live in sin, and they're going to play it under the guise of God's grace Paul said, when we do this, there's no more forgiveness for that sin. Paul wants us to know, when, when the writer of Hebrews said that, this is what Paul is alluding to. He said, why should we abuse the grace of God, if you look at verses 1 and 2? He said, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, the word when he says died is a strong word. That means we've separated ourselves from it. And so, as we look at it, let us look first at grace, because grace is experienced through repentance. When we repent, we experience the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith and nothing else, but yet we leave off the repentance of that. God expects us to repent of our sins. He expects to see a change. He expects something to happen. And I want you to know, if God has truly stirred your heart, you will be different. You will not be able to continue the same lifestyle. And one of the things that really hurts young converts, young Christians, 
And, and by the way, when I say young Christians, we automatically think of someone that's young in age. That's not what I'm referring to. You can be a 70-year-old Christian, and you can be a young convert. You can be young because you just accepted Christ. So we often rank our spiritual age by our physical age, and they're not the same. They're nowhere near the same. You can be a one-year-old Christian, and you can be 70 or 80 years old. You can be a 20-year-old Christian, and you have to be older than 20, I can tell you that. But if you're 40, you can be. If you're 30, you could be. And we're expected to show growth based on that level. We're expected to show that. We're expected to experience that. And so we're, we're saved by grace through faith and nothing else. But then this is where it gets confused. Now, this is, this is something that, that we often struggle with. We often struggle with repentance. Well, what if I, I slip? Well, the truth is you're going to sin every day. The catch is you're not going to commit the same sin every day. At some point, you're going to break free from that particular sin, and you'll move on, and you'll have other battles in life, and I don't want to misguide you. There will be some battles. But we shouldn't continue in the same sin every day. Grace means we cannot earn salvation. It's not our work. It's his work on the cross of Calvary that saved us. But then this is where our work comes into play. We are to repent of it and change the way we live. It's expected. People will say things like, well, you know, preacher, I used to. Let me tell you something. If you've repented of that, and God has forgiven you, you need to move on. It's over with. Stop tormenting yourself over what you did years and years ago. Stop doing that. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants to keep you locked in that sin from yesteryear, and, and you think, well, how could God truly forgive me? How can I really be forgiven? And, and, and you say, well, I know that God's forgiven me, but you're always referring back to that particular thing don't let that thing be a stronghold in your life. Let it go because the blood of Jesus has made it let you go. So it's time for you to let go. Let it go and move on. Grace is experienced through repentance. The grace of God is evident. Now, when I, I mentioned a young Christian, don't be discouraged when you find out that not everybody is excited about your salvation as you are. And this is one of the things that young Christians struggle with, regardless of age. Young Christians struggle with this because they get excited. They want to tell people about this freedom, this deliverance that they've experienced and, and through Christ. And they find out that the other people are like, that's great. They really don't care. Don't be shocked when the world doesn't care. And, and, and I'm going to take it a step further. Some of those that don't care, they're probably going to pick on you a little bit. Oh, yeah, oh, someone's so Calvin, he, he's into that phase. I remember uh, a person one time saying that when I surrendered to, to preach, they said, yeah, I went through that phase too, but it, it wore off. I'm like, really? Well, mine hasn't worn off yet. So I, I don't think that's the way it's intended to work. Now, let me say this. God may change your ministry. He may change your location. He may take the preacher and send him to Timbuktu to be a missionary. He may take the, the missionary and bring him back to be a preacher. You never know. But it doesn't mean that you just wear, it just wears off and dis, dissipates and disappears. That's not what happens. You say, why are you telling me this? Because this happens among Christian folk, not just preachers. People come in excited about what Jesus is doing. You go home, you find that your wife is not excited, that your husband's not excited, your children are not excited, your parents are not excited, your brothers and sisters are not excited, your neighbors could care less. They don't want to hear any of it. And then you get discouraged and you begin to wonder if you've done the right thing. Let me tell you, just because the majority doesn't buy into what you think and, and what you've experienced and what you feel, uh, the way you think that is, and what you're feeling and what you have encountered through Christ doesn't mean you should walk away from it. It should never wear off of you. 
It's not like a garment that just falls all to pieces later. It should get stronger and stronger the longer you live in the grace of God. We experience grace through repentance. Paul says, should we continue in sin? The answer is obviously no, and he answers that. He says that we're a new creation. Paul would address that. We're a new creation. In other words, the old self has died. This person no longer lives. And, and one of the things that people struggle with when they look back at sin from yesteryear is to say, how in the world, what was I thinking? What did I do? Let me tell you what. You were not living as a Christian. And you're not going to think as a Christian if you're not a Christian. Just thank God that you can think as a Christian now and that you do think as a Christian and you think as a person who's been saved, a person who's been enlightened, a person who's been forgiven, and a person who's been delivered. Just thank God that you're that way because he has given you his unmerited favor that you and I don't deserve. And his son took the place of the penalty of sin for us on the cross of Calvary. There's no more penalty for repented sin. And so when we repent of it, we turn from it, and there's no penalty. But if you don't, well, that's another story. We could not be good enough for God's approval. That's why Jesus came. Now, I have a pastor friend that I haven't seen in years, but uh, I think he eventually moved out west, but we differed on this. He said, I believe you can be good enough to be accepted by God. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, are you good enough? He said, I think I am. I said, well, okay. By the way, that's a really bold statement. I want you to know that. That's like really bold. And I said, so that means that you don't have any sin in your life. He said, right. I said, well, have you ever sinned? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, if you ever sin one time, you're not good enough for God. One time. By the way, we're all born sinners. <laughs> Now, I know that's clear as mud. We're all born sinners, and so we've at least been born into sin, and we can't be good enough to escape the consequences of it. That's why Jesus came, and if we could be good enough, then the law would have been sufficient, then the Pharisees would have been fine following their legalism, and everyone else would have been too. But Paul said we cannot, we cannot continue living under the law. We have to live under grace and you can imagine emerging from one system to another is quite difficult. It's ingrained in you. And so we shouldn't con continue in sin. We should be different because we're a new creation. The old self is dead. The new creation lives. And by the way, sometimes old things and new things do have a lot of resemblance. You think, well, that's completely different. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Sometimes... New things have similarities to old things. Some of the differences become evident as you get closer to them. Even though there's similarities, they're not exactly the same. You say, well, what do you mean? I still look the same, but I don't act the same. And so there's a change that has come as a result of Christ working in me. And so, what happens if a Christian sins after they're saved? Well, you're going to. That's why you repent. And, and, and let me tell you, please don't be generic in your confessions. Now, I understand that, that there are times we, we just want to clear out, clean out the closet, so to speak, and we may not know. But what I suggest, instead of saying, Lord, forgive me for anything that I may have done, Lord, reveal to me what I need to repent of. Show me in my heart what I need to get out. Show me in my heart what I need to change. Because if you leave it generic and you say, Lord, forgive me for anything, you're destined to repeat that again. And you may not even realize that you're doing it again. But if I have the Lord identify it for me, then I can work toward not doing that anymore. So pray and ask God to identify the sin in your life. So you're not perfect. But then that's also an excuse a lot of times. Well, preacher, you know none of us are perfect. 
Yeah, I know. I know. But that's not an excuse. And that's the way it's meant. Well, preacher, you know, no, no, it's so perfect. That's why I didn't, you know, we just follow. No, 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 no. No. I already know we're not perfect. But that's not a legitimate excuse to continue in sin. We could benefit from asking Jesus to search our hearts. We could greatly benefit from that. Lord, search my heart. Search my heart, O Lord, and try me. Test me. See if there's any wicked way in me that I need to repent of. Lord, work in me. You see, the old person has been crucified, meaning that the old nature has been put to death. Now, that moves us to the second thing. When we look at this, Paul said, we're not supposed to live any longer in sin. When you're saved, you're really supposed to turn from that. But then he gets into the issue of baptism. And this is where the law and grace really clash right here. You say, well, over baptism? Yes. Because they were not practicing baptism the way that we practice it as the identification of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ being associated with him. And for a person to be buried in his likeness in baptism, let me say it this way. For a person to be baptized, the reason they would say uh, they would acknowledge Jesus as the, the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter would later say, be baptized in Jesus' name. The reason he used that was because he was dealing with Jewish people that believed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they didn't believe Jesus was the Son, and therefore it was a public announcement of who they were trusting in, and that was Jesus. And so what they would do is they would go out and sin, and then they would come back and they would commit their act of baptism to wash away their sins. Baptism doesn't wash away the sins. The blood of Jesus does that. Baptism, as Paul points out, it identifies us with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And therefore, when we're baptized, it's not just to wash away our sins. It is to identify us with Christ. It is to say that the old man has died and now the new person is living. And all of this is through Christ. And they would go sin and then they would come back and do their work. Well, I'm going to get baptized and wash away my sins. Really? You haven't used water in Mississippi yet. Because I'm telling you, you're probably going to get a bad infection before it's over. This water is not pure enough to wash away your sins. Water can't cleanse your soul. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. And so there comes a time when we have to, have to acknowledge what we need to do. And he clarifies in verse 6 the reason that we are baptized. He wants this to be clear. When the, the, is, the issue of the Church of England came up, years ago and people were breaking away from the church of england and by the way that's what this the thing of separation of church and state is not in our constitution i want you to notice that they use that to try to keep the church out of government but the point of what we call freedom of religion and they've added it as separation of church and state the whole point of that was to keep the church from having, I mean, the government from having a state-run church the way that it once was. And that's why there was such a battle on people breaking away from the Church of England. Because they had to pay the church, the, the Pope, and they had to pay all these people as they, as they lived their life. They had to buy people out of purgatory. They were taught these things. And uh, they were illiterate. They couldn't read. And, and so it was, a, it was an issue. They would believe whatever would come along. And people decided at that point they were christened as children. They were infant baptism. That meant that they were saved, and later they would come along to an age, and they would know that they were saved. But then what happened was they started practicing believer's baptism. You have to be a believer to be baptized. If you notice, we don't do it the other way around. You accept Christ, and then you are baptized for the identification. 
If you've been baptized before you've been saved, then you've not been baptized. You've only been dumped, but you've not been biblically baptized. You say, well, preacher, I was sprinkled. Well, the word baptize or baptizo does mean to dip, immerse, or, or dunk under. But I want to tell you, that's not going to keep you out of heaven. I've mentioned this before, but let me mention it one more time. The reason that sprinkling came into play was during drought times. They just couldn't waste the water. It was necessary for their life, their livelihood. And so during droughts, they would just sprinkle the people. They would sprinkle them. Does that mean you're less saved? Well, if you were saved by baptism, maybe. But since you're not saved by baptism, no, it doesn't mean that you're any less saved because you're saved by the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ should bring about an enormous change in your life and in my life. And so Paul said, God forbid that we should continue in sin and that we should label these things in a legalistic way to accommodate our continuing in sin. This is not what it's about. Friends, we should change as a result of what God is doing in our hearts. It should be evident. People should be able to notice something different about us, not because we walk around saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, all this stuff all the time, but because we live with integrity, because we live with character, because we live in the right standing with God, these things cannot help but to emerge from your life. But you're not going to be perfect. That's not an excuse. But it means that we are to continue striving in an ongoing manner. You're always striving to be better today than you were yesterday. We're always striving to enjoy that grace. Grace is experienced through change as well. And that's exactly the point Paul is making. Grace brings change. How has God changed your life? How has God changed your life? I've looked around a lot lately, given a lot of prayerful consideration to a lot of different things. I've looked at churches. It's not an excuse for us that churches are declining. It's not an excuse for Oak Hill, but they are. There's a few that's doing well, but there's a lot more that's not. And what I see among the Christian body is this. Complacency. We're satisfied where we are. We don't want anything to change what we're doing. And you say, what do you mean in the church? Let me tell you what I mean with this. In order for a church to become complacent, the people have to be satisfied where they are in their spiritual walk with God. You should never be satisfied where you are in your walk with God. Never. Because there's always more to achieve. There's always more to accomplish. There's always more to experience. There's always more that God wants us to do. For a church to become complacent means that we've become spiritually complacent personally. It's time that we search our souls and ask ourselves where we are in our walk and what God wants to do in us, in our walk with him and our service to him. Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we do this if we die to sin and no longer live in it? There is one sin that I'm going to mention before I close my Bible and have an invitation. 
That is the sin of omission. That is the ultimate plague that the church faces. We omit our service. We omit our sacrifice. We omit everything. If you want something exciting, there's other churches with a lot of lights, a little louder music, maybe even more people. But what are you going to do when that excitement wears off? When you're no longer thrilled by the light show and the performances? Our growth does not come from light shows and performances. It comes from relationship with Jesus. And that's what we need most. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this word today. And as I share this, Father, I know that anytime we talk about sin, it is a difficult subject. It is hard. But I pray today that you will work in our lives beginning with me. Father, we just let complacency, omission, we just let it ruin our service sometimes. We let it stop our service to you. I believe that every born-again Bible-believing Christian is called in service, and we need to worship and glorify you. Father, today, I ask you to forgive us for the sins in our lives as you reveal to us specifically what they are. I ask you to help us let go of the sins of yesteryear that you've already let go of. And I pray that we will make a commitment right now that we will not continue in sin, but that we will move forward in the grace and love of our Savior, Jesus. Father, today during this invitation, if there's one person here that needs to be saved, I pray that they'll come forward. If there's a person looking for a church home, I pray if they believe this is it, they'll come forward. And Father, I just, I ask you to work in your Holy Spirit, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And during this time of invitation, I do want to invite you to come. If it's salvation, if it's uh, to pray for someone, to pray for yourself, whatever it may be, you can sit on the front row, you can come to me. Whatever your need is, if it's for a church home, just know if the Lord leads you, that you should be obedient. Come as you need to come. Come. Come, come.
I'm going to ask Jimmy if he would come and dismiss us in prayer, and I'm going to ask you to stay where you are for a brief moment after he prays. i got a very short announcement to make. I love you all, too, and the Lord loves you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being the privilege of being in your house this morning, being in Sunday school, learning to trust in your word. We thank you for the hymns that we sang and the song that we sing out to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this inspiring message Brother Calvin delivered this morning to help us to resist the temptation of sin. And we pray through the Holy Spirit that uh, our sins and transgressions will be known to us through the Holy Spirit that we may turn away and repent, Lord. We ask, Father, that as we leave Oak Hill, we will turn away from the world and turn to Lord Jesus and help us in our walk of obedience so that others can see that we serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us now as we leave Oak Hills. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you.